All right, thank you. Thanks, Clay. Um, I've got my slides a little bit out of order there, but never mind. I'm going to go back to uh, my intro. Uh, th this session, it's, it's, it's all about looking at vibrating pipework. And what we're going to talk about is why the heck do pipes vibrate? Um, what's the big deal there? What's, what's the, the, the issues? Why are they vibrating? And if they are vibrating, what's the big deal? So what we're going to try and do is look at some of the causes of piping vibration. And we'll look at several of the issues associated there. And what we'll end up with is we'll look to, to try and figure out and help point you in the general direction to say whether piping vibration is going to be acceptable or not. All right. Oh, and here we are back again to me. Uh, let me introduce myself before we get started. Uh, my name is Ron Friend. I'm the Head of Facilities Training for Petroskills. I came in through John M. Campbell, as I'm sure quite a few of you know. Uh, I got my Master's at Huddersfield University. Uh, I used to be a marine engineer, so I was with Shell Tankers from 70 through 84, and I was seconded to Petroleum Development or MAN, still with Shell in 84. I started off as a an engineer, and I ended up as head of technical support. And that's when I left and set up my own consultancy. Right now, as I'm working with Petroskills, I do quite a lot of training. And of course, the way things are at the moment, I don't do quite as much face-to-face -face training as I would normally expect to. And so we're doing more and more virtual. But training is something that I enjoy. And I am going to introduce my colleague, Stu Watson. Stu, are you around? Yeah. Hi, Ron. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us here. Um, my background is uh, mechanical engineering from Australia, and um, I've done quite a lot of uh, piping stress analysis and piping diagnosis problems. And um, I'm here really as a, a panelist to help support Ron uh, answering all the q and I'm sure there's probably going to be a, a little bit of dialogue between Ron and I through this um, through this time. Um, if you I hope that's at, not just disagreement. <laughs> <laughs> if, you, if you look back at some of my projects, they varied from you know a, a facility engineer working with um, El Paso Natural Gas in New Mexico and and various <clears> projects uh, in an operation sense, as well as uh, new build greenfield projects uh, in various parts of the world. I've been with uh, Petroskills since 2009, uh, when I started with John M. Campbell as well. Um, I've loved and enjoyed each, each step and change along the way, and this current environment is definitely new for sure. Uh, so uh, right now, I support Ron really in a, a technical advisory role as well as uh, instruction when those uh, opportunities arise. Um, my disciplines of support are obviously mechanical engineering and uh, gas plant operations as well is where I, I spend a lot of time. Anyway, thanks, Ron. Thanks for uh, having me on board here. Appreciate it. Thanks, Duke. Appreciate it. I know we're going to have some fun. Okay. Okay. So this session, we'll talk about the objectives. What are we trying to do? First of all, we're going to say, why do pipes vibrate? Because they're just static pieces of equipment. They shouldn't really be shaking around there. When we're talking about vibration, we're really talking resonance. So we're going to go a little bit back to school, not too much, but we'll go a little bit back to school, and we're going to talk about resonating pipe work, what causes resonance. So we're going to look a little bit into natural frequencies and a little bit into forcing frequencies. And then we're going to say, well, it's vibrating, but is that OK? Is it dangerous? Is this going to explode? Because the title of, the, of this session here is, so you know, my pipes are vibrating. Should I be worried? Yeah, you should, depending on what's inside your pipe. If you've got a pipe full of gas, and that gas starts to escape because of a crack in the pipework, or some tubing that's been ripped off a header, and you're going to get a lot of stuff getting out there pretty pretty darn quickly. Um, I was involved in one incident in the Middle East where there was a, a gas leak through a crack, and one person died, 
and three other people were quite severely injured. So I do hold this quite close to my heart. So we know how much vibration we've got. What we do want to end up with, if the vibration is not acceptable, what can I do about it? So that's when we'll say, how can I fix it? Now here's an interesting statistic. I got that from the UK Health and Safety Executive. And what they did was they looked at all of the hydrocarbon releases in the UK, in the oil and gas fields, and they quantified what was actually the issues, what was causing them. And you can see pretty clearly here the big one. Look at this guy there. 21% of all of these piping failures were caused by vibration, which started a fatigue failure. And uh, when you get a fatigue failure, you're going to get a crack, usually. Uh, I did mention if you get a big pipe, you probably will get a crack. If it's tubing, and Stu mentioned this to me earlier, and it's something I, should, I, I really need to mention to everyone, tubing does not tend to just crack and leak a little bit. If you get a failure of a tube, it's probably going to rip itself off, and you're going to get a lot of release. Okay, so let's start off. <clears throat> we're going to start off fairly simply, and we're going to start talking about natural frequency. And the first thing about this thing about natural frequency, why am I worried? Well, it's this thing called resonance. Now, this issue here is this little image. It always takes me back to my grandson. And my eldest grandson is 12 years old, but when he was young, I used to take him up to the park. I mean, he's three years old. I've got a park at the end of my street, and there are child swings. And I did what we all do. If you've got children, or you've got nephews, nieces, and so on. Put them on the swing, pull the swing back, let it go. That swing is now going to go backwards and forwards at its natural frequency. And that natural frequency is going to depend on a few things, because now that swing is a pendulum. So that thing is going to swing backwards and forwards depending on the length of the pendulum and also the mass on there. But eventually, What's going to happen because of friction and windage? The swing is going to diminish until eventually my grandson's shouting at me, hey, granddad, push the swing. But what I could do, I could just pull the swing back and let it go again, but I don't. What I do is I wait for the swing to come to me and I give a little push, very little push. Comes back, I give another little push. He's only three years old. What I'm doing is I'm pushing at the same frequency as the natural frequency of the swing. And what you also notice, when I'm pushing, I'm waiting until the swing's at its peak amplitude nearest to me, and then I give a push. In other words, I've locked phase. So I've got a phase lock. I'm pushing at the same point in the cycle and I'm pushing at exactly the same frequency as the natural frequency. Now, if I pushed at a different frequency, I would be pushing at different points along the cycle. And that means some of my pushes would try and increase the amplitude, but some of my pushes would try and decrease because I'd be fighting the swing. But because I'm pushing at the same frequency, every little push is adding to that amplitude. We don't have a swing. What we have is a pipe. And what we've now got is something that's causing a vibration that's acting on this pipe. Now, if that frequency of pushing is exactly the same as the natural frequency of that pipe, it's going to keep increasing the amplitude, increasing the amplitude, until eventually it's only the dynamics and the elasticity of the pipe and the stiffness and the damping that's going to try and hold that amplitude in check. But you could get such a severe amplitude. Oops. Someone's trying to take control. Sorry, guys. Sorry, Arnaldo. You can't. <laughs> so, ah. Sorry, guys. I don't know what's happened there. I've just lost my uh, my screen. 
there we are. There we are. We're back again. Okay. So what's happening? We're pushing at the same frequency as the natural frequency. And because I'm pushing at the same frequency as the natural frequency, the amplitude is going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. As the amplitude does get bigger and bigger, the stresses associated with that swing are going to be so high that we're going to induce a fatigue failure in the pipe, possibly. Okay, let's move on. The first thing I want to do, because I'm an engineer, I want to be able to calculate what is the natural frequency of the pipe. Now, we're going to do this in a fairly simplistic way. And we're going to do this by assuming that the pipe is a beam. And that's, that's fine. That's good, because the pipe is a beam. The pipe is a beam, but instead of having an I section, it has a circular section. That's OK. What I'd like to draw your attention to is this little formula up here. And that is the natural frequency is a function of that and that. And E and I, E is Young's modulus. Now, in SI units, that's going to be 200 gigapascal for steel, approximately, or 20 million PSI for uh, FPS units. I, that's the moment of inertia. Now, you remember when you were at university, you mechanical engineers, I'm sure will rem remember this, calculating the moment of inertia of an uneven shape. Well, the good news is this is not an uneven shape. This is an even shape. And because it's an even shape, we actually have a formula for calculating I. And it's 0 0.049 multiplied by the outside diameter of the pipe to the power of 4 minus the inside diameter to the power of 4. Simple, isn't it? In effect, what this has given us, E is the, the properties of the material. I is the properties of the shape. This gives us stiffness. On the bottom here, we've got mass per unit length, mu, and L. L is the, the distance between the supports. In effect, what we've got is mass per unit length and L to the power of 4. That is the overall mass of the pipe. Now, don't forget, this could be empty or it might be full. But what it means is immediately we can see if I increase the stiffness, I'm going to increase the natural frequency. If I increase the mass, I'm going to decrease the natural frequency. So it's a fairly simple calculation. But look at this guy, A. That's a modifier. I'm just going to pull something else up here now. This is a chart I'm sure many of you guys have seen. And what it does, it gives us values for A, A1, A2, A3, A4, and A5. And it gives us that value for different arrangements of the supports. There's two I'm interested in. One of them is a simply supported arrangement. And that's simply where I've got, if I've got the, my pipe is just sitting on a simple support like this. That means the pipe is allowed to move on either, in either direction. The other arrangement I'm interested in is clamped clamped. And that's something like this. This is where I've actually got a clamp on the pipe. What this is doing, it's restraining the pipe at that position where the pipe's being held. So you're going to get a different frequency of vibration. In effect, it's made the pipe stiffer. And if we make the pipe stiffer, we increase the natural frequency. The other type of arrangement is uh, simply supported. And this is just where I've got a pipe just sitting on a simple support. And now the pipe can angle. It's not as stiff. The natural frequency is going to be lower. So if we do one example, Using the same formula, we've got a, a section of 12 inch pipe, 300 millimeters nominal. Um, we've got clamped supports, 7.5 meters apart, 24 and a half feet. The pipe's flowing fresh water, 
what's the natural frequency? And it, it's pretty straightforward. We can look at, as long as we know the schedule, we know the OD and the ID. Once I know the OD and the ID, I can calculate the mass of steel in that pipe. And I'm going to do this, in this case, because it's metric SI units, I'm going to do this for one meter. And all I do is I calculate the volume of the steel. A steel's got a density of about 7,500 kilos per cubic meter. So if I know the volume, I know the pipe steel weighs 132 kilos. At the same time, I can calculate I because I know the outside diameter and the inside diameter, and that's my value for I. What I can now do, I just go back down, I calculate my natural frequency, I plug these numbers in here, and I end up just less than 35 hertz. But this pipe is full of water. And if it's full of water, I now have to take the mass of the water into account as well. So I take the mass of the steel plus the mass of the water, and that gives us almost 200 kilograms per meter. Again, plug that in, and guess what? No surprise, we find that the natural frequency is less because we've got increased mass. Increased mass gives us a lower frequency. Now, this is not just a university or a college or a school project. This is something you guys are going to have to do for real. But be aware that this is the easiest case. This is simple. If what we're doing now is we're calculating the, the beam frequency, this is a beam on its own. In real life, your pipe work could be attached to uh, T's, could have valves in there. It's going to be more complicated than this. So you're probably going to need software. But for now, this is something that can get you going, and it's a nice, simple start. So the learning points of this are mechanical natural frequency increases with stiffness, and it decreases with mass. Okay, let's get moving. So what we've got is we've got a pipe with a natural frequency. And we have said that resonance is when you've got a natural frequency and a forcing frequency. Well, the forcing frequency now is what I'm interested in because I know the natural frequency. This could come from my running equipment. It could come from vortex shedding. It come from a, could come from acoustic. And we're going to look at each of those in turn. And this, I think, is where most people are interested. So let's have a look at your rotating equipment. Uh, <clears throat> there's, I, I've brought up a, a list of different possibilities here. Th this is by no means a complete list, but it is an interesting list. And what I'd like to think of first is look at this electric motor driven. If I've got an electric motor drive and I'm usually thinking of an induction motor, the speed of the induction motor depends on the frequency of the supply and how many poles are in the motor. So just for example, if I've got a four pole motor and I've got a 60 hertz supply, this will try to run at 1800 revs per minute. That's if you've got a 60 hertz supply. If you've got a 50 hertz supply, it will try and run at 1500. But you've also got something called slip. That means your motor will not run at exactly 1800. And if you look on the nameplate, you'll probably see that there's a speed on there, a rated speed, but that's a full load. Your pump or your compressor will not run at that speed. It will run somewhere between the electrical frequency, and 1800 RPM is 30 hertz, so somewhere between the electrical frequency and the full load rated speed. Now, you don't know exactly what it is until you check it, but you can make a bit of a guess. Uh, interesting thing we, I did here, I just did a little quick calculation on 1700 RPM, convert that into hertz, it's 28.33. Hey, guess what? Natural frequency in my pipe, which is full of water, is 28.35. You can pretty much bet your bottom dollar that thing's going to be vibrating like heck. 
But the thing is, that is only the speed. Where the heck is this force coming from? Well, this is where we go down to the rest of this list. If you've got an unbalance, you will get a vibration at run speed. So one of the things you might want to think about is, if I do have a, a high vibration coming from my pump, from my compressor, maybe I need to get it balanced. It's not a long-term solution, because getting the fan or the pump or the compressor balanced will give you a short-term fix. But eventually, it's going to go out of balance again, and you're going to get resonance back. Uh, misalignment will give you vibration at run speed, but also harmonics of run speed, 2x and 3x typically. If you've got something loose, maybe a bearings loose in the housing because the, the housing's a bit worn because of age, you can get harmonics all the way up to 10x. You could have pulsations, particularly for reciprocating compressors. That's a big one. But also, don't forget, any sort of positive displacement piece of equipment particularly reciprocating positive displacement, will give you pulsations. Uh, if you've got a centrifugal pump and it's not running at best efficiency point, you are going to get vibration from vein pass frequency. If you've got a variable speed pump and this, this thing starts maybe on auto and it's just hanging there at low speed, there's a good chance you're going to get vibration from that too. And that could be exciting the low frequencies. And don't forget, if you've got two machines running together at what look like the same speed, maybe you've got two pumps side by side, two compressors side by side, they won't run at exactly the same speed. There'll be a very slight difference between them. That will induce a beat frequency. And even that can cause problems. Man, life is difficult. <laughs> so be particularly wary of variable frequency drives because that can come in and out of that natural frequency range. So, a learning point for this is you're forcing frequencies from rotating equipment come from the speed and the physical properties. And a lot of the time, when I say physical properties, that could actually be a defect. Okay. Now, something of interest to a lot of folks. Vortex-induced vibration. Now, this is quite interesting. Um, there was a, a gentleman quite a long time ago called Carmen. And Mr. Carmen, who was a professor at one of the universities, can't remember which one, but Carmen did do a lot of research on, on oscillations caused by flow going across a section. Now, you've all seen something like this. You look at a windy day, and you look outside, and what you find is maybe one of the street lights is moving from side to side. That's being caused by this guy here. So imagine that this is that, that street lamp. So we're looking vertically down on the circular cross section. The wind is coming in that direction. Now, as the wind comes up to the, the lamp post, what we'll find is that because of very slight differences in air pressure, maybe you've got slightly more pressure there than I do here, that means a little bit more of the wind will come around in that direction. But because it comes around in that direction, that means the air pressure here increases, the air pressure there drops, so now it comes around in that direction. This pressure now increases. So what we get is an oscillating force moving backwards and forwards. And as the, the wind or the liquid flow comes around, you will get turbulence here. And this is the reason why a flag flutters, because it's at the back end of a flagpole. Now, you might find that you can see this happen on a pipe. And I've seen it happen, um, particularly on Vertical pipes are long stretches of horizontal pipes. But you can calculate it really easy. Von Karman and Strauel came up with this number, and they said the frequency of this oscillation is the velocity of the fluid divided by the diameter of the obstruction. There's a constant there to make this work, and that's called the Strauel number. Now, normally we can use 
0 0.22. Oops, sorry. Now, if I use 0 0.22, that means I can easily calculate what that frequency is. Now, just be careful of the number. Um, the actual Stroll number does vary a little bit with Reynolds number. But if you're working anywhere between about 100 to even up to a million uh, Reynolds number, this 0.22 works for a circular cross-section. Uh, other cross-sections don't have exactly the same. But for us, because we're working with pipes, pipes tend to have a circular cross-section. So I'm okay. So for example, if I've got wind blowing at 20 meters per second over a 600 millimeter pipe, 20 divided by 0 0.6 meters, Strowell number 0.22, 7.3 hertz. Easy. Practical application of this. There was a, a problem in Alaska. In Alaska, the pipelines uh, tend to be above ground because of the frozen, uh, the frozen earth. And what was, what was found was that there was a lot of vibration on the horizontal pipelines. And in fact, this is a trace. This was done by a company called SSD in Reno, Nevada. And they did the research on this. And what they found was a vibration amplitude, and this is in inches. So from plus 0.1 to minus 0.1. So you're getting a displacement, a physical movement of that pipe of two tenths of an inch. Now what they did, they, they devised a hanger system and the natural frequency of this hanger was exactly the same as the natural frequency of the pipe. By putting something on there with the same natural frequency, this tends to move in the opposite direction and it dampens the vibration down. And this was the end result. So it's not the end of the world, but if you do go to Alaska and you see these weights hanging off pipes, that's why they're there. But what about inside the pipe? Now, I've just taken an example of a gate valve with a non-rising stem. Um, you could have the same thing with a butterfly valve or a thermal well. And you've got flow going along here, and the flow goes around the stem. If I've got a 35 millimeter diameter stem, the flow to five meters per second, my Strawell number stays the same, five meters per second velocity, 35 millimeter, 0 0.035 meters of the pipe, uh, the stem diameter. That gives me a frequency of 31.4 hertz. Now, this could be problematic because we've already seen with some of the calculations we've done already that this could be right in the range where we could have problems. So. This thing about vortex-induced vibration is a function of fluid velocity and the diameter of the obstruction. Okay, let's have a think about acoustics. Oh, let's have a drink of water. Okay. Right, this is going back to school, isn't it? This isn't even university. This is high school. <clears throat> Remember from school? C equals F lambda. C is the acoustic velocity, the speed of sound. Now, in air at sea level, normal pressure, that's going to be about 330 meters per second. But if we're talking about speed of sound, that means that the sound is traveling. Now, as I'm talking, the, my voice box is vibrating. That's what's causing the sound. So as my voice box vibrates, it hits air molecules. And those air molecules impact air molecules in front of them. And that impacts other air molecules. In fact, what we get is an area of high density and an area of low density. So to go from the one area of high density to the next area of high density, we call that the wavelength. As I'm speaking, the air is not traveling out of my mouth at 330 meters per second. That would be really unpleasant. But what is happening, that hammering effect of the air molecules against each other, that is happening at 330 meters per second. Now, if I'm sat in my car at the traffic lights, lights are on red, my engine's running, 
the car's making noise. The noise is traveling away from my car, and I can hear it, or you can hear it. You're standing on the side of the road, and it's traveling at 330 meters per second. So we know that this is 330. This is my wavelength, lambda. So I can measure that, and that gives me a discrete frequency. What I'm now going to do is I'm going to wait for the lights to turn to green. Now I'm moving. Now let's imagine this is not a little um, a little sedan car. What I've got now is a Ferrari. And I'm traveling at maybe 60, 100 meters per second. I'm really flying. Now because I'm traveling along, in front of me, the sound is still moving away from me at 330 meters per second. But I'm traveling as well. And it means that these wavelengths are now getting smaller. But behind me, the wavelengths are getting stretched. What we're talking about here, guys, is the Doppler effect. And what this is doing, if the wavelength increases, the frequency increases. So if that goes down, that has to go up. Now, you're standing by the side of the road, you hear a, a car go past, you hear that. That's exactly what we're talking about. Okay, what's this got to do with pipes? Well, unfortunately, Mr. Doppler is in your pipe. And what we've now got is some vibration. And it's this now acoustic vibration. Now, if I've got acoustic vibration, I will end up with standing waves in my pipe. The standing waves are being carried by the fluid inside the pipe. Now, the example I'm showing here is, well, I've got two examples here. I've got a section of pipe in between two bends, and that has a half wavelength. As you can see what's happened there, We've got that full half wave thing. In fact, if we go up to here, where it says open tube, I can see that is a half wavelength. The full wavelength would go up, down, and back up again. So the section of pipe between two bends gives us a half wavelength. Down here, I've got a standpipe. Maybe this is a drain line. And this has now only got a quarter wavelength because this is now a closed pipe. So what we've got is a closed tube give me, gives me a quarter wavelength. An open tube gives me half wavelength. Now, don't forget, these are only fundamental frequencies. You'll also have overtones. But what actually happens? We, we do have something of an issue here because we still have C equals F lambda. So we've still got speed of sound in here. Now, I remember when I was a boy, one of my friends uh, had a bugle. And he could get a really good tune on that bugle. And it was it was nice. And I remember I tried blowing it and it went <laughs> It didn't work really well at all. What my friend did, he pursed his lips and he blew at just the right speed. By blowing at just the right speed, he hits the sweet spot. You've all done something similar. You get a, a bottle of water, you've drunk half the bottle, and as kids, you blow across the top. And if you blow at just the right speed, again, you hit a tone. And that's because you've got the, the velocity just right to set up a standing wave in that pipe. Now, our issue is Mr. Doppler. <clears throat> Mr. Doppler has said, what, what we are doing now is we are going to look at your wavelength and we're going to change your wavelength if you've, got, if you've got movement. Now, in the car, that was easy to see. The car was moving along. It squeezes the wavelength in front. It stretches the wavelength behind. We're now going to flow in a pipe. And the, as the, the flow is moving along the pipe, that flow is also going to have an effect 
on the, on the speed of sound. It's also going to have an effect on the wavelength. But it's easier for us to calculate this in terms of speed of sound rather than directly on the wavelength. So what I can say is now, we'll use this example, and that might help explain it better. Right, the pipe in the previous example had supports at 7.5 meters, but the distance between the bends is 8.3 meters. Now, if I just go back to that previous slide, I have something I didn't mention there. There's something called an end effect for open pipes, and you have to add about 30% of the pipe ID at each end. And the reason is you're not getting a reflection back from the closed end you're getting an apparent reflection somewhere outside the pipe. And this is going to be out here somewhere. So if we're doing this calculation, we take the speed of sound, and this has been given to us on here at 365 meters per second. The end corrected length is now 8.9 meters. Because remember, we had a we had a pipe of a certain diameter, we take 30% of that and add that on each end because it's an open, open pipe. We've got a 22 molecular weight gas flowing through at 20 meters per second. Right, first of all, that wavelength that we're interested in is we take the physical size and multiply that by two. Because remember, it's an open, open pipe, so it's giving me a half wavelength. So the wavelength I'm interested in is 17.8 meters. <clears throat> okay, so the frequency that that's gonna give me, 365 meters per second, which we had up here, divided by the wavelength is 20.5 hertz. But we've got fluid flowing along our pipe at 20 meters per second. 20 meters per second, I assume that's, well, yes, it is gas. So, so 365 plus 20, so I'm modifying the velocity, dividing by the same wavelength, that now gives me 21.63. So what's actually happened is we've changed the frequency, we've changed this acoustic frequency because we've got liquid flowing along the pipe or gas flowing along the pipe. This is important because it means that in simple conditions, or maybe certain design conditions, you don't have any problems with your pipe. But then you start changing your flow rate through your pipe. And as you change your flow rate through your pipe, suddenly the thing starts to vibrate. And if you start getting this sort of frequency to be the same as your mechanical natural frequency, You've got resonance. So you know, I often get people asking me, you know, what's the issue? Yeah, I have this system here for ever since commissioning. I had no problems with it. But then we just start increasing the, the output by another 5%, and suddenly this pipe work's going crazy. I'm not saying this is the answer, but this is one avenue you should be checking. And notice on here I said plus 20. You should also do minus 20 because this works on both directions. So, this is a forcing frequency, it's the same as a natural frequency, you've got resonance. So Doppler does cause a change in the apparent acoustic frequency. Uh, the question you should be asking now is, the resonance of what? Because up to now, what I've mentioned is only the mechanical frequency of the pipe itself. But there's also the stuff that's inside the pipe. And if you've got gas in that pipe, well, gas is compressive. It acts like a spring. If you push against the spring and release the spring rebounds, so does the gas. If you keep pushing at the same frequency as the rebound frequency, you've got resonance. Now, we do have a little formula here. Back to what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this thing here. The natural frequency of the gas inside the pipe is the square root of the elastance divided by the inertance. Now, I've skipped over these. Let's go back to them. What is the elastance? The ratio of pressure and volume. Think stiffness. 
Now remember when we calculated the natural frequency of the beam? We said the natural frequency is a modifier times the square root of the stiffness divided by the mass. Stiffness is on the top again, but now we call it elastance. On the bottom here, we've got inertance. Inertance of fluid reactance is a measure of the pressure difference in the fluid required to cause a unit change and the rate of change. All it means is, look, what's the density? What's the length? What's the area? This is the resistance. This is the thing that's stopping it trying to vibrate. So all we do is we calculate the elastance and the inertance. All I need is the ratio of specific heats, the pressure in the pipe, the volume in the pipe, the density of the gas, the length of the pipe, and the cross-sectional area of the pipe. You've got all that. That's easy. Let's do an example. Right, the pipe in the previous examples has a distance between the bends at 8.3 meters, which gives us end corrected length of 8.9. We still got our 22. <laughs> yeah, we still got our 22 molecular weight. Oh, this thing's gone crazy. Sorry, guys. We got our 22 molecular weight gas flowing through 20 meters per second at a pressure of 2,000 kPa and a temperature of 80 degrees C. I'm going to calculate my density. Pressure, molecular weight divided by universal gas constant, temperature, compressibility. 15.6 kilograms per cubic meter. I calculate the inertance, density times L over A. L is 8.9. I calculate the cross-sectional area. Gives me 2121. I calculate the elastance. The ratio of specific heats for 22 molecular weight, a good guess is 1.24. You should get this off your spec sheets anyway. Uh, the pressure is 2,000. The volume, which I calculate, is 0.583 cubic meters, which gives me that number. I do the calculation, and don't forget your 2 pi, because this is going to be in radians per second if you don't. And it comes out at 7.13 hertz. So nothing too difficult. But the learning point here is the gas natural frequency changes with molecular weight, pressure, and temperature. So if your specific gravity changes, that means so will this, this frequency. Right, we're almost getting towards the end, guys. I think we're not too bad for time. So now, are you going to put velocity transducers on your pipe work? Full time. Now that'd be crazy. Apart from that, it's expensive. So usually what's going to happen, if you get a vibration problem on a pipe, you can ask the vibration tech to go out and have a look at it. So what we'll do is we'll put a transducer on the pipe, but where are you going to put it on the pipe? But what I tend to do, if I get this problem, I'll get a piece of chalk and I'll go along with my hand. If it's a hot pipe, I'll put something between my hand and the pipe. <laughs> I don't want to burn my fingers. But what I'll do is I'll mark out where the nodes and the antinodes are. This is a node, and this is indicating the amount of vibration. So at the node, you've got zero vibration, and that should be where you've got a support, particularly if it's a clamped support. So I've got a node here. I've got a node here, and I've got an anti-node right there. And if I want to measure the maximum amplitude of vibration, that is where I'm going to place this guy. So I'm going to measure the vibration where the vibration is highest. If you want to be really good at this, you could take a full scan, and you could map the pipe completely. That's just to make sure that you're not getting, instead of the first mode of vibration, you could be getting the second mode. Well, what that now gives us is something that's interesting. Because if I know the amount of vibration, what I can now do is I can calculate the stresses. In this example, I've, take, I've calculated the bending stress. So 8E, Young's modulus, diameter of the pipe, that is the displacement 
divided by the square of the length between the supports, or the square of the length of the pipe anyway. Now, if I've got six millimeters peak to peak, eight times 200 e to the nine times 0 0.306 the diameter of the pipe times 0 0.006 meters divided by seven and a half squared. That gives me 52.8 megapascals. Now, you're gonna, you should be asking me, what's this graph for? Well, this graph is the fatigue curve of carbon steel, low alloy steel, anything below 552 megapascal tensile strength. And most of our pipe work is way below that. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna plot on here 52.28, and that gives me this many cycles before I can expect failure. This is about seven to the power of nine. We're talking billions of cycles. But what if the vibration was two times this? What if it's 12 millimeters peak to peak? That gives me a stress of 104. I plot 104. Wow. This is not so good, guys. If I've got two times 10 to the five cycles, that means I can expect failure in 1.8 hours. If on the other hand, I've got seven billion cycles, and I'm assuming the vibration is at 30 hertz. At 30 hertz, that's gonna give me 2,700 days before failure. The point of this, guys, is six millimeters per second, you could probably live with it. 12 millimeters per second, phew, no way. This is really, really bad. So the learning point here, small changes in vibration can cause drastic changes in the time to fatigue failure. So watch out for this. Now you're gonna say, well, all right, what's bad? Oh, I put this one up just for completion. Um, we're talking about pipes generally. If you're talking about trunking, trunking's a different deal altogether, and I'm not going to get into trunking. Um, but just to let you know, I've not forgotten about it, but I'm not going to deal with it. Right. <clears throat> How much vibration is acceptable? Well, API 618 gives us this graphic, and you might say, well, 618, that's only for reciprocating compressors, isn't it? Well, yeah. But what I do like about this, it does give me an actual amplitude that's acceptable. So I can take vibration, in, this is in inches peak to peak, anything below 10 hertz, 0.02, that's great. Once you get above 10 hertz, then the acceptable amplitude decreases. If you, on the other hand, you look at what the Energy Institute gives us, it's rather different. The Energy Institute allows us to calculate a vibration damage factor. But the thing is, even though it looks rather different, it's still very, very conservative. Remember, we calculated six millimeters per second. Peak to peak would give, us you, give you a life of 2,700 days. That's years. That's very, very conservative. This is different, but it is also conservative. Okay. Just about to finish up here, guys. So, what can I do about it? Well, if it's a mechanical resonance, go for the obvious stuff first. Probably, if it's a mechanical resonance, it's probably gonna be caused by a piece of running equipment close by. In fact, I would say more than 90% of the time, that's where I've actually found it's a problem. And that's fairly easy. If you can change the running speed, great. Um, if you can't, what you could do, well, if we were talking about changing the forcing frequency, try repairing the defect. If you've got an unbalance, balance it. If it's misaligned, align it. If it's loose, tighten it. <laughs> uh, if it's vortex-induced vibration, try changing the flow rate if possible. Um, you could put strakes on a pipe. Uh, this is an example of strakes on a chimney. And that's there purely just to break up the vortex vibrations from the wind. 
But you could install these tune frequency dampers we saw on the Alaskan pipeline. You could change the mechanical natural frequency. Now, what, when I'm checking this, what I sometimes do is just get a piece of stout wood, hammer it in at the anti-node, and just see if that changes the vibration. But be careful, because if you start putting support and you make it too stiff, you can end up causing more problems. So we don't want that pipe to be too stiff. We want it to be flexible. But we want it to be stiff enough, it changes the natural frequency. Uh, I did see a, a friend of mine in Oman. He went out on a fin fan cooler that we had resonance problems on, and he dumped a bag of sand on the structure. Vibration went away. He changed the apparent mass. So there are other options. If you've got acoustic resonance, if you've got a recip compressor, make sure you've got a properly designed and installed pulsation dampener on the discharge. That will solve a lot of those problems. And don't, don't go cheap on this, guys. Don't go, go for the, the cheapest of the cheap. Get something that's really going to work because these sort of problems can cause major upsets. So get yourself a pulsation dampener that does work. Uh, avoid the flow rate causing the vibration. Easy to say. And I imagine the... Uh, the manager's not going to be too happy if we tell him we can't actually provide the, the flow he wants. Uh, change the acoustic natural frequency. That's a possibility. I've done this a few times. Modify the pipe work. Maybe just change your valve position. I remember working on a compressor, a centrifugal compressor in Beijing. And we had a huge vibration on the discharge pipe work. And it was a problem where the NRV, the non-return valve, was installed. We moved the NRV and the problem went away. So the endpoints are identify your natural frequencies if you have a problem, identify your forcing frequencies, but what we really should be doing is design out resonance at a very, very early stage. Determine if your vibration is acceptable or not, and if necessary, change either the natural or the forcing frequency. Don't do what a client of mine did in Ohio one time. This guy had a problem with the design for a new fan. And he listened to what I said, and he said, I can't understand it. I've gone and installed stiffeners in the bed plate, and it's still resonating. And when, we, when I went and had a look, he installed stiffeners, sure enough, which had increased the natural frequency. But these stiffeners were made of I-beam steel, which weighed about 350 pounds. He then he lowered the natural frequency again, ended up right where he started. So try not to do that. Okay. And that's about all I've got on here, guys. Um, wow, I've almost got five minutes left. <laughs> uh, just as a way of the, the marketing and trying to sell you training courses, please come and join our training courses. We'd love to have you. Um, Stu and myself both teach ME44 and ME41. Um, if you have a need... For um, any SME, we do have a bunch of SMEs. Just on the facilities side in PetroSkills, we've got 50 SMEs. And the particular area of expertise ranges. Uh, it's just different depending on the different people. We've got some people who are very good designers. Some people are very good at looking at vibration. We've got some people who are good at rotating. Some people are good at static. Some people are good at production. All the list goes on and on. Um, Webinars coming up soon next week. Uh, Deborah Ryan is going to do a webinar on black oil basics. The week after, Mahmoud Moshvegian is going to do propane refrigeration, minimizing power requirements for greenfield projects. And the week after that, Jeff Hammond is going to do for subsurface, recognizing additional productive potential in existing fields. And that is me. Okay, Stu, I see some activity in the Q&A. Um. <laughs> it's actually, there's, we kind of went through, and the, there weren't too many questions going through, and this has been two or three questions that have turned up in the last five minutes. Okay. I was going to start answering them, and I thought, well, uh, let's just uh, do this verbally, a bit of backwards and forwards. So, um, uh, Erica Santa Maria, shall we consider flow-induced vibration for applier cases, for example, on all relief 
valve tailpipes. And I, I know that when you look at API 521, it gives you guidance on um, reaction loads and things like that on relief valves. I, I also know that the company that I used to work for, we used to have uh, some guidelines in terms of design of standard designs for tailpipes, and so we wouldn't look at that there. I probably, personally, I would um, consider this on um, some of the larger relief valves and probably less so on the smaller relief valves. And then um, depending on what equipment it's tied to, if it's tied to um, uh, vibrating equipment or if it's a very long relief system, then I might look at that in more detail. Flare headers generally tend to be um, very, they tend to be very light piping and they tend to be um, prone to a lot of uh, flow induced and acoustic induced vibration. And so there is definitely cause for concern here. So I don't want to um, be blase about my response on this. Um, these days in a lot of piping systems, especially greenfield projects, uh, quite a lot of stress analysis gets done. And once you bring the piping into a stress analysis model, it's fairly quick to perform a dynamic analysis on that piping system where you would establish uh, some of these uh, natural frequencies and so forth straight out of the software. So there are some quicker solutions that would come about through those systems. Um, Ron, have you got anything else that you would like to add to that? No, you pretty much got it covered there, Stu. But the one thing in the flare system I'm, I'm worried about is uh, sonic velocities. And just make sure that your passing volume doesn't exceed your sonic velocities. That's the big thing. But yeah. also, it's, it's fairly straightforward. I, I wouldn't worry too much about fire case. Yeah. yeah. So, um, I'm not sure if we've answered your question there, Erica. Um, feel free. We can follow up afterwards with emails and we can also tie in thinking um, some of the other gas processing engineers might be good to follow that up on as well. Khaled mm. Shaman uh, asked the question, what about acoustic vibration on flare systems? Could you shed some light on the causes of the issue? Um, so yep. <laughs> Khaled, we're, we're talking about um, understanding the molecular weight and gas properties, temperatures of your process fluid or fluids, various fluids that could end up in your flare system. Uh, you, as you change the mole weight, you're going to change the natural frequency, um, sorry, the sonic velocity of the gas. You've also got fairly high velocities. Uh, we talked there about fractions of sonic anywhere from up to maybe as high as 60% of sonic velocity in your flare system. So that can have a huge effect on uh, the Doppler effect that Ron was talking about earlier. And then once you understand the geometry in that flare system, uh, we start to understand the half tones and quarter tones that turn up um, in, in that flare system. Flare systems often, in a lot of new cryogenic plants, flare systems are being made out of stainless steel. Stainless steel is expensive, and so quite often, um, I see people going to thinner wall stainless steel. Um, as a result, that becomes more prone to um, flexibility and, and damage as a result of that acoustic induced sound wave traveling down the pipe. And that can cause some resonance. And, and now when you think about a very thin wall pipe and a high amplitude uh, sound wave, of varying frequencies, it becomes quite difficult to design out um, the, that problem. Uh, we very quickly get into fatigue issues because we're talking about high frequencies, while the flaring events might be quite low. Because we're talking about frequencies, then the, the fatigue event may come on quite quickly. And um, so it could be a blowdown that's going into the flare system that may be a significant concern. And so as we analyze those systems, trying to design them out may mean that we have to stiffen up a particular 
portion of the flare system. Um, I get particularly concerned when I see Schedule 10S being used on flare systems, and I also get particularly concerned when I see OLEPs and branches into that flare header, because an OLEP is a high stiffness uh, connection onto the run pipe, and, and so that high stiffness combined with that very soft, uh, flexible run pipe, we end up getting a stress concentration right there. Um, I'm not sure I've answered all your questions there, but just kind of perhaps highlighted some of the concerns and, and issues that I've seen going on there. Ron, maybe. Yeah, there, there might be a, the other thing I've seen on flares is sometimes the flares puffing. You can see it, seeing that, and sometimes this is caused by. It's quite often it's caused by a control valve problem, but um, but this can be one of the issues that you should be looking at. You know, if you get a standing wave set up at a particular flow rate, you've got some kind of control upset, is what you're thinking, Ron. That's time. yeah. Float, some some big, float, that could be anything. That could be uh, process piping. Could be. Know. Yeah. Could be. But I've right. seen this. I've seen standing waves on this causing a, a problem at a particular flow rate going through. But if you've got a sticking control valve, hey, that's going to cause puffing anyway. So different issues. <laughs> uh, Leandro Chihuahua, no, I'm sorry if I butchered your name there. I'm so sorry. Uh, in case of a PSV gas relief pipe, which is undersized and has a sonic flow, Mark One. Are there any additional phenomena to consider besides IV, AIV, and reaction forces? And my my immediate one uh, that I would be worried about there is the relieving capacity. Um, is your yeah. is your is your relieving capacity still there for that system? Because generally, if you're choked at the relief pipe, you've got a capacity issue. Um, beyond beyond FIV and AIV. And reaction forces maybe think about erosion. Um, you could have a high back pressure as well. well that's going to be yeah. going up all these other valves. Yeah. Oh, that's a good point. If you tie into a flare system, uh, is is that one relief going to cause problems on another part of that flare system? Mm -hmm. uh, Gabriel, is it a correct in? Inference to say that vibration induced into high pressure gas line flowing wet gas will be higher than similar pipeline flowing dry gas. Um, vibration induced into high pressure gas flowing wet gas. Wet gas, um, as you change your molecular weight, uh, your sonic velocity should be going down um, as compared to dry gas. And when we're talking That's wet gas and dry gas here, I'm assuming that we're talking hydrocarbon wet. And so there is an increase in mole weight for wet gas versus dry gas. Um, I, I, I mean, everything would need, to, we would need to look at the details and see exactly how much that would change the molecular weight and therefore change the natural frequencies. Yeah, I would definitely be looking at that. and. No matter what you do there, you, you've got to start looking at the the individual properties on a case-by-case -case basis and see just how much they are going to be changing. Might need a bit more information here to be able yeah. to understand and answer your question, Gabriel. But feel free to email Ron or myself and we can are definitely keen to try and um, dialogue some of these questions a little more. Um, but, that's kind of at the end of the questions here. Um, there was a question in chat. Oh, hang on a second. I see one there about measuring natural frequency, and uh, you're talking about bump testing. Yeah. Yeah, I was just going to mention on the, when you do a bump test on a piece of rotating equipment, you tend to use a, a hammer, maybe an instrumented hammer, and that works out pretty well. Doesn't work out so well for big pipes. What you're better off doing there is reverse pluck. So what you do with a reverse pluck test, get a big piece of rope and a come along, you pull along the pipe, get your vibration transducer on the pipe and you cut the rope. <laughs> Just be careful how much you do, don't do too much. <laughs> yeah, otherwise you're not going to excite the, the low frequencies, the, the, the real frequencies of the problem. 
Have you done that? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Be careful of the the, uh, the rope as it uh, swings. Yeah, I bet. <laughs> um, so there's there's also a good qu question here. Uh, it turned up in chat. Um, Philip Tudhope uh, asked a very similar question about uh, flare systems and um, acoustic induced vibration inducing problems on flare headers and, and uh, blowdown systems uh, leading to overstress and fatigue failure. So I, I think we kind of dug into that, Phil, in the, the answer there that we had um, with Erica. Um, Uh, Bruce Quair, uh, slug catcher for Bonnie LNG Trans 1, 2, 3, had a serious vibration caused by slug flow. Uh, piping stress uh, added snubbers, but these were destroyed in a short term. I solved the problem by using acoustic insulation to increase the mass. Lead impregnated rock wool. Uh, wow. Very interesting, uh, Bruce. I have not heard of that particular uh, product, have not used that. In the past, when I've had to add mass of perhaps changed pipe wall or clamped things to the outside of the pipe to increase mass, um, the issue that you're talking about when you have um, a multi-phase line flowing into a slow catcher, I've seen those lines during pigging events moving significantly. Um, and so trying to control that piping and designing that piping is, is very key in the the design process. Quite often what I've seen there is a breakdown in engineering between whoever has the pipeline design and whoever has the slug catcher design and they sort of point the fingers at each other. And so your your question here is highlighting the need to really look carefully at that the handover of ownership between uh, the pipe the pipeline and the process plant and who's got that slow catcher. Um, I've seen a lot of concrete uh, tie down supports and pipeline anchors in that area. So uh, we, we had this, um, it almost looked like a welded flange on the outside of the piping and a giant concrete block underground to try and grab the pipe and dampen out some of these stresses from that uh, slugging event. But in, in onshore and offshore platforms, this particular issue becomes quite a complex problem for sure. So nice, um, nice identifying some of these high stress events. And again, these become, if you think about trying to analyze that particular event in a uh, piping stress analysis situation where you've got a massive density change in the flowing fluid, um, you have to be quite creative with your load cases um, where you can lean back on some SMEs for their experience and, and what they've seen work well or not well. Uh, maybe that helps answer some of those questions. I think, uh, think that's... Is that one from Stammer? I'm looking for... The bottom a, of the chat. To reach resonance, I should equalize the frequency that comes from the blades of the impeller with the resonance frequency. All right, Samer, I know what you're doing. <laughs> Samer's got a PhD project in Berlin, and he's trying to, to work on uh, acoustic frequencies and resonance. Um, Samer, the, the, the one issue that you've got there with blades of an impeller and you're trying to induce a vibration, if you're running at close to best, yeah, <laughs> if you try to run at, um, if you try to create these pulses and you're running near the best efficiency point, you're not going to get much of a pulsation. That's going to be a bit of a problem. So you, you really need something else to induce your vibration. I see if, I don't know if I can unmute you. I can't. Watch some else saying some privileges. The other aspect of vein passing frequency there, Ron, is always the, the tip to casing clearance. 
And so um, if you can reduce, you know, if you're trying to create that vein pass increase. That's the point. That's a good point. I came across that once in, a, in an aluminium plant, and uh, there was cake out on the on the volute. And yeah. we did have high vib high pulse vibration that way. Good point. Yeah, that that might be something worth looking at. So the the tip clearance on the impeller, uh, the cross blade, the actual blade um, clearance to the casing, and I think API six ten gives you guidelines on what you should have there. <laughs> so just just don't do what I. Do. <laughs> <laughs> But I'm sorry, I can't unmute you, uh, Summer. But but please, uh, I'm, and I'm not seeing that question, Ron, because it might be to you directly. But uh, maybe, yeah. I, I think I think we're probably close to the end here, anyway, right? Yes, I think uh, so. I, I, if you have questions, please feel free to email them across to Ron or myself, and we'll compile the the Q and A questions here and um, put them into a Word document. I imagine that goes up with the recording. Um, and get sent out on the, the webinar page, right? Yep. Thanks, guys. I will. Uh, I will definitely take this transcript of the questions, the answers, and we'll put that up there with the uh, recording. So, uh, thanks everybody for the for the good questions and for taking the time out to join us. Uh, thanks, Stu and Ron, for lending your technical uh, expertise. Um, and uh, we appreciate everybody's time, and we hope that you'll uh, join us for future sessions as well. My pleasure. Thanks, guys, for joining us. Really enjoyed it. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. All right. Stay safe, everybody, and take care. You too. Bye. Thank <laughs> you.